That song right there is why Inspire is, because we have a God that we have that kind of hope in. Um, we have several families that have experienced and are experiencing the face of death. We want to remember the Bacchus family. I know you just took some of your relatives home um, to the airport today. And uh, that grieving of the, the loss of, of their son, your cousin, family members, just we want to keep the Bacchus whole family in, in prayer. Um, Chuck uh, reminded me that there's a friend of his, Reuben Gines, and his wife, Vicki. Um, their family, he just went into hospice and is not likely going to be coming back out. So that hope in God, um, we need to keep them in prayer so, so we can, uh, they can feel that hope in the presence of, of God um, as they go forward through the days. But it's a God that we serve that did the impossible, right? He did the impossible that overcame death, overcame all that that holds us back. Um, a God that sets us free and gives us that freedom. And that's why we come to worship and remember. And in those weeks and days that we are trudging through and not sure how we can break through, remember we serve a God who does impossible things. Um, that's what we're studying in Luke, and, and actually today we're going to make it through chapter 5. We're going to bust through the barrier. I've been on chapter 5 for the last, what, five weeks? Um, never thought we could dwell so long in a chapter, but it is rich with, with how he overcomes impossibilities. Um, impossible situations. I was with Peter, and Peter, because he said, because you say so, I will, Peter was able to break through some of that. With impossible situations that people go through, when we can't, Jesus says, I can, and I'm willing, and that was the leper. We had Jesus breaking impossible barriers with the paralyzed man being lowered through the barrier of the roof so people can get to him, get to life. And now we're looking at the story of Levi, later known as Matthew, the calling of one of the most unlikely, impossible to believe characters to be part of his world-changing team. Now, if you... Um, Band members did not get cake. Feel free to come up at any point, Glory Bell. You don't have to cut it. It's pre-cut for you. <laughs> we were talking about that earlier. Um, all right, Luke 5, 27 through 28. After this, the healing of the paralyzed man who came through the roof, Jesus went out and he saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him. And Levi got up left everything, and followed him. Now this one sentence, having been read back there, this whole event happening would have sent shock waves through people. But it just gets better. It goes on. Levi held a great party for Jesus at his house, and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. And all of them included the disciples as well. Now, to understand the shock value, we have to understand a little bit more about Levi. Now, we've all heard that tax collectors are bad. Don't hang out with tax collectors if you were back in those times. Well, you just don't realize how bad tax collectors were until you dig in a little bit. So, M Matthew, Levi, essentially was, in my understanding, the equivalent of a mobster. Okay? Mafia. Jesus and his disciples were hanging out with the mafia. Let's just put it that way. Okay, the mafia is known for serious criminal activity, including extortion, cheating, stealing, murder, arson. This was Levi and his people. This is Levi and his people. And Jesus specifically chooses Levi, mafia man, to join him. And he wants Levi to help lead his movement. And then Jesus, God, takes the rest of his team and he parties with the rest of Levi's underworld godless cohorts as if nothing were amiss. This is a normal course of how you live life. Now, I really, in, in digging through this, I can't believe that a movie hasn't been written about just this segment of the Bible. Because, I mean, set in the 1920s, mobster times, and that's, that's when they were about, right? I mean, you have the life of Levi, how he betrayed his family, went into collusion with a nefarious organized crime syndicate protected by the police, the mayor, the governor, 
taking advantage of the citizens for personal financial gain and power. And then the story would have this twist with how the president, or the president-elect being Jesus, starts building his administration team, wanting to set the tone for what his new government's going to look like, and recruits the worst leadership you can imagine. Uneducated, hot-tempered fish hatchery workers, political rioters known for wanting to form a coup for revolution, and now a prominent member of the mafia. This is Luke 5. All right, so how bad were they? The greatest eye-opener as I started digging was not that there were people like this back then, and we're going to get into it, but that Jesus specifically pursues these kind of people to be his closest friends, that Jesus specifically pursues these kind of people to be his leaders, the ones who would help shape the future, carry on the message and work after he was gone. He pursues these kind of people to carry on the image of God, the right image of God to the world. It's going to blow you away like it did me. The tax collectors, they worked for the Roman government. They worked for the Roman government to extract money from the citizens. Now, Jewish tax collectors, such as Levi, were especially hated because they were betraying their own people to do this, collaborating with the enemy who occupied them to exploit and abuse his own people. It was betrayal on many fronts. One, Levi was helping tax his own people for land that at least in their eyes, was rightfully theirs. God had promised this land to the Jewish people, to Israel. And now it was occupied by foreigners who were ruling over them and were forced now to pay taxes just to live there on this land that God had given them. Number two, add to this, they were having to pay taxes to an emperor who proclaimed himself to be the son of God. So this is blasphemy to support such a leader. Number three, it bordered on idolatry for many of these Jewish people because the coins that they had to handle and pay the Romans with were engraved with the images of either Caesar or other Roman gods on them. And even to have such a thing in your hands was a form of idolatry. And so that was also blasphemy. So it wasn't just betrayal of his people. Levi wasn't just betraying his people by forcing them to pay and working with the Roman government, but it was blasphemy to God, so it was betraying God himself. Pretty weighty. If that wasn't enough, how tax collectors got their money legalized extortion through threats, force, blackmail, and worse, just added salt to the wound. Here's how it worked. The Romans would set an amount that they wanted to receive. This is the amount of money I want to receive. And they'd put it out to bid. Who's going to contract and say, you're going to bring this money to me? All right? Once you and I have an agreement, then whatever you make above and beyond what you agree with me, with the Roman government, you get to keep. You get to keep. Now, that was how the system was established. As time went on, when you got to the New Testament times, it had, it had become reformed a little bit more, but still had lots of room for abuse and extortion. There were two types of taxes collected, stated tax and duty tax, and two types of tax collectors, the gabe and the mox. It sounds like two gang members, right? The gabe and the mox. Okay, Gabe were general tax collectors, and they collected stated taxes. This was ground or property taxes for property owners and the crops that they grew. So if you had property that you owned and you grew crops, then one-tenth of your grain would go to Rome, one-fifth of your wine. And you could actually pay in grain or wine to the Roman government, or you could give the equivalent in money to them. Income tax was for everyone, 1% of all other income earned. And then there was poll tax for being alive. So you paid your tax just for being alive, all right? Not a lot of wiggle room in the stated tax category. And those were the gabai, that's how, gabe, that's how they, they collected taxes. Now, the mocks were a different story. The mocks, they collected duty on imports and exports. Now you have the great mocks and you have the little mocks, all right? Great mocks and little mocks. The great mocks were the overseers. They hired others to do the dirty work. They hired the little mocks. Total mafia system, do you see it? All right, great mocks, little mocks. Great mocks would buy the rights to certain regions. 
And they're like, these are my regions. These are the ones I get to tax. Zacchaeus likely would have been a great mock because it says he was a chief tax collector. All right, so they would have a right to a certain region. They would hire their little mocks, and the little mocks would go and do the actual work. They were despised. They were the most despised ones because they made it happen. They had the incentive and the power to do whatever they needed to get whatever they wanted. As long as their GM was paid, the rest went to their own pockets. So the little mock it would set up their toll booths by the roadsides, by harbors, by docks, by bridges, at festivals, anywhere people were moving to and fro or gathering, the little mocks would set up their booths to tax the people. They could tax for any purpose, using the road, using the bridge, using the dock, having a cart that you're carrying your produce in. They would tax the animal pulling the cart. They would tax each wheel of the cart. There was a purchase tax, and so they could tax on whatever you brought in and whatever you were selling or bringing back out. A little mock could stop a man on the side of the road, have him unpack his bundles, charge him for whatever he liked, and if the man didn't have the money, then the little mock would be so generous as to lend him some money at an exorbitant rate and own the man for the rest of his life. They set up their booze and moved around anywhere they'd like. And so what could happen is a farmer could be used to using a certain thoroughfare back and forth. That's how he would go to market. That's how he would, the road he would take, everything was fine. And then one day, there'd be a booth in the middle of the road. And suddenly, he had to pay taxes. There are reports that they were so universally hated that their own lives were constantly being threatened. Many of them were murdered as well. They would, these tax collectors, to get taxes, they sometimes would burn villages. They would sometimes murder someone so their family would pay up. They, this, there's no doubt that they had their own lives threatened. And many of them had bodyguards that they kept nearby to protect their lives. There was a proverb at the time, it said, bears and lions might be the fiercest wild beasts in the forest, but publicans, another word for tax collectors, and informers were the worst in the cities. They were also some of the wealthiest. They got rich on the backs of others. So they were traitors, they were blasphemers, blasphemers, they were unclean, especially unclean as seen by the, the religious authorities, just like the lepers. If they entered a house, the house was deemed unclean. They were banned from entering temples or synagogues, excluded from the religious community. No one was allowed to help them, and they were not allowed to be a witness in a trial because no one trusted them. There was one Roman writer who tells us that he once saw a monument to a tax collector, an honest tax collector, do you get the irony of that? It was so rare to have an honest tax collector that he got his own monument. <laughs> That's pretty profound. And this is who Jesus chose as one of his own, a leader. One who would tell his story. Who would believe the writer, Matthew, who was a tax collector? Who would believe anything this man would say or do? So Levi was an outsider. Outside the temple, just like the leper and the paralyzed man, now we come to Levi. Outside of religion's reach, outside of anything reputable, outside of hope for an eternal future. And yet, Jesus approaches him. Jesus went out, it says, and saw a tax collector sitting at his tax booth and said, follow me. What's important here, whereas the leper and the paralyzed man sought Jesus, Levi was not seeking Jesus at this moment, Levi was sitting in his booth. He was in the very midst of his mafia criminal activity, doing his thing, getting wealthy, and Jesus seeks him out. Jesus seeks him out and invites him to join in. He saw something in Levi that apparently everyone else missed. He saw value and possibilities where everyone saw impossibilities and worthlessness. 
One commentator, Alfred Edersheim, he was a biblical scholar and historian, had an interesting theory, I thought, when I was reading about this story, that in light of how tax collectors worked, made a lot of sense to me. He postulated, po postures that it could have been quite possible that Levi had been tracking along with Jesus all this time to tax the crowds, right? Everywhere crowds would go, everywhere Jesus went, Levi went, it would be a smart move because it would be a great opportunity. People would be sitting on Roman-owned grass and Roman-owned hillsides and cross crossing Roman streets to get to Jesus. And at every juncture, Levi could be there taxing away. He probably taxed Jesus too. Jesus wouldn't have been exempt from taxes. But of course this would mean that he would have heard Jesus' teaching as well. He would have seen the healings. Who knows what the effect could have had on him. He wasn't allowed in the temple to learn about God. He was not allowed to sit with good, well, no good religious people would want to sit with Levi and talk with him about what they learned. They couldn't talk about spiritual matters. He was completely shunned from that whole world. So anything he would have learned about Jesus or about the God that Jesus presented, the God of love, the God of forgiveness, the God of grace, would have been from following him. True, making his money in not so great ways, but the message could have been getting through. While he was doing his despicable deed, yet was Christ reaching him. Maybe this is one of the very reasons Jesus ministered so often on the outside of the temple, on the outside of of the synagogue walls for just those people who would never make it inside. If that theory was true, what's pretty cool is instead of Jesus running him off, instead of asking Levi to go somewhere else and making a big scene, he does the complete opposite and invites him to be one of his followers as if to say, you know what, Levi, since you're already following me, why don't we make it official? And Jesus not caring what society thinks, not caring about how the other religious people seem to be running their lives, even not caring at that moment what Levi is doing, he invites him to follow. It's typical Jesus, right? Radical God. Those whom the religious rulers rejected, Jesus accepted. Those they despised, he loved. The ones they avoided, he sought out. I think there's a lesson in this for us. Looking at this first half of the Levi story, we see that God chooses on purpose, intentionally seeks out, chooses the least likely people we would ever think would be considered Sometimes it's the least holy amongst us, the most by all appearances and behavior, most rebellious rule breakers, the least spiritual, the most sinful, the least respectable of human beings. He purposely seeks out, chooses them, invites them as they are in the midst of what they are doing. He chooses to say, I have a place for you, a purpose for you right now. Follow me. With all of your baggage, with all of your failings, with all of your shockingly bad behavior, past and present, I still want you. Of all people, I choose you right here, right now, as you are. That means that God chooses you and I, right here, right now, as we are. He says to you and I, as we sit in our own tax, tax booths, our anger booths, our always messing up and sliding backward booths, our self-righteous ones looking down on others, our impatient booths, our incompetent, skill-lacking, education-lacking, experience-lacking booths, our self-serving, self-focused booths, our withholding forgiveness, our refusing to say I'm sorry and try again booths, our addiction ones, our greed ones, our comfortable and complacent to the suffering ones. Whatever booth you and I know we operate out of, those places we struggle with, sometimes, sometimes not. Those booths that benefit us somehow. 
at the expense of another. Jesus says to us when he said to Levi, I choose you. I want you. I value you. I have a place for you right here, right now. Follow me. God calls impossible to believe characters to join him in his work, to be his closest friends, to be his mouthpiece, his hands, his heart. God calls impossible to believe you and I. So if you're ever doubting that it could be so, which we do as human beings, we know who we are in our darkest souls. If we ever doubt that we're destined for the side of the road, stuck in our booth, out of the realm of making any impact in this world, in our families, at work, through the words and actions of those close to us, we need to read the story of Levi again and be encouraged. Now I said that Jesus called Levi and he didn't care what he was doing. I want to clarify that just for a second. I think Jesus cared beyond what Levi was doing. I think Jesus knew if Levi said yes and followed Jesus, if Levi chose then to walk at Jesus' side, then whatever he was doing that wasn't working, that wasn't so healthy, God would take care of it. God would handle it because God is so much bigger than his or our flimsy roadside booths. He knows we are much more than what we appear because he created us to be so much more than we know. And he can, and God will, take care of those places, transform them, deconstruct them, and recreate them as needed, when needed. Because a few boards and canvas that protects our human weaknesses are nothing to the person of value that God sees behind it all. He sees you and I like he saw Levi, a person that delights in our originality. A God that sees us as a person full of possibilities and great potential. He sees a person he loves deeply just as you are. And as your creator knows who you can be with him in, through, and with you. It's interesting to note that when Jesus called Levi, he didn't ask him to do anything but follow him. At that point, all he wanted was for Levi to start spending time with him. Teaching and transforming would come. He didn't ask Levi to give his money back either. Did you notice that? And neither did Levi offer like Zacchaeus did. Jesus didn't ask Levi to sell his big home that he had purchased on the backs of victims, nor did he tell him to stop seeing his horrible friends. Jesus simply said, follow me. And whatever steps he would start taking with Jesus, God knew those would be enough. That's what God wants us to do as well. No matter where we sit, he says, follow me. That's all I ask. Start walking with me. And we have his assurance and from Paul in Philippians 2.13, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purposes. It is God's spirit within us that transform us, transforms us, not us transforming ourselves and then getting with God. It is God who comes inside to act and to will in order to fulfill his good purpose. And I love the first steps that Levi takes. The first steps, walking with Jesus, what does Levi do? He throws a party together. He throws a party inviting all of his tax collector, sinner, criminal, crooked friends, which would have pretty much been all the bad people in town. Drug dealers, alcoholics, prostitutes, criminals, dropouts, the whole mafia clan. And Jesus. Oh yeah, and Jesus. And Jesus brings his disciples with him. Doesn't even hesitate, but he goes and he brings his disciples. 
The ones he is training to be like him. He brings us to the the mafia party. The ones he is leading to become more godlike. The ones he's making sure will know and be able to accurately convey what the kingdom of God looks like, sounds like, feels like, tastes like. And he takes them to the party without hesitation. Because God's not about isolation And he is not about exclusion. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law, on the other hand, were beside themselves. Trying, no doubt, not to have a conniption fit. When you read the words in in Luke, it looks like they're, they're all at the party. And then the Pharisees and the teachers of the law say to his disciples, and it seems pretty seamless. And it seems like, well, they're at the party too. But there's no way that these Pharisees and teachers of the law would have been at this party. I cannot even begin to imagine because the religious rulers of this time especially went to great lengths to avoid sin or even the appearance of sin. So certainly hanging out with the unclean, it was a no-brainer that they would not do that, not eat the food of the unclean because the food would not have been ceremonially pure. There's no way they'd be close to their standards. Sharing a meal with a sinner which were the only ones at Levi's party, was like saying you endorsed their sinning. It was as if you're saying you're not just okay with it, but you're actually supporting them and doing what they do because you're obviously not speaking out against it and you're not avoiding it. Just didn't happen. Now, there was a rare case where a Jew would have eaten with a Gentile in a Jewish home. Invite a Gentile over, eat in your Jewish home, you're in control. There is no way that a Jew would eat with a Gentile in their home. And certainly not an unclean, blasphemous, wanton criminal and traitor to God and their people. So it wouldn't have happened. So I imagine the Pharisees and the teachers of the law lurking on the outside. They're hearing the music playing. They're peeking in the windows. They see Jesus cracking up at something one of the sinners said. They see the disciples swapping stories with these criminals, laughing, eating, drinking, dancing. And their shock and disgust just builds. Jesus calls himself a rabbi. Again, this is not what a proper God-fearing rabbi does. And this is not how you train your disciples. What kind of example is this? Just wrong, 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 wrong. So first chance they get, they pull his disciples aside. Maybe they were gun shy to talk directly to Jesus because of what happened just a few verses ago with a paralyzed man. But they thought maybe we can get them back on the straight and narrow. So how it goes. I love how the Message Bible lays it out. The Pharisees and their religion scholars came to his disciples greatly offended. What are you doing eating and drinking with crooks and sinners? Jesus heard about it and spoke up. Who needs a doctor? the healthy or the sick. I'm here inviting outsiders, not insiders, an invitation to a changed life, changed inside and out. Not here to polish the righteous, but give hope to those who need it most. They asked him, John's disciples, they're well known for keeping fasts and saying prayers and and also the Pharisees, but you seem to spend most of your time at parties. Why? Why? Jesus said, well, when you're celebrating a wedding, you don't skip on the cake and the wine, you feast. Later, you may need to pull in your belt, but this isn't the time. As long as the bride and the groom are with you, you have a good time. When the groom is gone, the fasting can begin. No one throws water, cold water, on a friendly bonfire. This is kingdom come, exclamation point. The Pharisees are questioning Jesus on who he's choosing to hang out with, crooks and sinners, what kind of disciples he's choosing, certainly not like John the Baptist's disciples, and how he's training them, going to parties more than fasting and praying. You see, for the truly religious, it's kind of an interesting point, fasting, not partying. Fasting was what you did and what you taught your followers to do. John the Baptist did this and others did it. And what you did back then, you fasted on Mondays and you fasted on Thursdays. Both days, all days. And you painted your face white so people could see how sickly you were. So they would know that you were religious and fasting. That's what a rabbi did. 
That's what Rabbi Jesus was supposed to do. But your disciples, they say, they're eating and drinking. Apparently so much that later in chapter 7, we see that they're like, you guys are like gluttons and drunks. What's going on? You party all the time. I love how Jesus answers. He doesn't say fasting is wrong. He doesn't say that you're being too religious. Clearly, later in Scripture, we see that Jesus and his disciples both fast. Now, Jesus teaches what the right kind of fasting is about, a focusing of the heart and the mind. But Jesus here brings them to a bigger point. You see, back then, the Jewish mind fasting was a large sign that you were not happy with the world. You were not happy with how things were, and you couldn't wait for the Messiah to come. This is why you fasted. The Messiah coming and your fasting, they went together. You were fasting so the Messiah would get here quicker and solve all the problems of the world. So Jesus essentially says, open your eyes. That which you've hoped for, that's what you've longed for is here. I am here and the kingdom being established in the lives of all who join in with this kingdom, this way of life that's going to right the wrongs of the world, it is here. And it isn't about somber motions of religion, about right or wrong prayer and fasting. It's about joyful experience of relationship. That's what the kingdom focus is about like that of friends celebrating at a wedding feast. When God is near, when God's heart is experienced, it is cause for celebration and enjoyment of life. This would have been and is a profound and provocative statement because Jesus is equating the most mighty, powerful, wise, holy, pure, right, righteous God and his kingdom to a party, the most holy of gods. The distinct markings of this new era of God's government, the symbol that he uses over and over again is celebration, is joy, is inviting people, all people in. He goes on to make his point. He says, you're questioning me about who I'm hanging around and how I'm training my followers, but here's the deal. Just like, and this is the last portion of chapter 5, just as you don't put a new piece of cloth on an old garment or new wine into an old vessel, neither can I put this new way of understanding God's kingdom into the old system. It's a new way of living. It's a new message. And it's going to require a new kind of vessel a new kind of disciple to carry it through. What I love is that Jesus never once puts down the old. He never once says it's of no longer, no longer value. He simply states that the new and the old are not going to be able to blend. They have different functions. Even back then they did recycling. They did reusing. When an old garment got old, they turned it into something else. When a wine bottle was too old to store good wine in, they put pitch and tar on the inside and they stored grain and water and documents in it. So they found other other functions. It didn't lose its value. It just changed until gradually it ceased naturally to be of use. They had their place and function. So Jesus, instead of authoritatively saying his way is superior, he simply offers another perspective. He doesn't get defensive. He doesn't make excuses. And he doesn't demand that they drop what they've known and what has worked for them this whole time. He simply invites them to try something new, as he talks about the old and the new. The last verse, the last verse, uh, 39, is a little confusing because it seems to reverse what Jesus was saying prior to it. The last verse, he says, No one after drinking old wine wants the new, for he says, the old is better. So why would Jesus say that after he's just talked about all this newness. Over the centuries, this has been debated. There's been little agreement on what it means. One commentator actually wrote, the meaning is simply not understood. But I see it as an understanding. Where the Pharisees are coming from, he is saying, I understand where you're coming from. I understand how human beings work. 
And I think it was Jesus' soft invitation. In this verse, I see Jesus setting a cup of wine on the table, saying, look, I know what it's like. I get the frustration. When you're used to a certain type of wine, a particular taste, a certain understanding and belief, a certain way of doing things such as old wine tastes better than new, it's hard to break from that. It's hard to fathom that anything new could possibly be worth trying. I understand. But I'm inviting you anyway to taste and see when you're ready. When you're ready, give it a try. Try opening your heart to a new way of seeing God. Try opening up to a new way of relating to others of what and how you invest your life. It's not going to taste right at first because you're not used to it. But maybe give it a try. Jesus knew time would prove it out. A spirit of love is more effective and lasting than legalism. Putting others first is better than being self-serving. He knew, though, that the wisdom of God can be like foolishness to men until they have eyes to see and ears to hear. So I think Jesus was looking, and today continues to look, for new disciples who have the kind of eyes and ears who aren't so ingrained in one way of limited thinking, who are already, perhaps even on the outside, he was looking then for disciples as he does now who are willing and available to try something new and different. The disciples he chose, what do they have to lose? He had a new wine ready to go and he was looking for new vessels to put it in. I believe God has new wine for every period and people in history. He has been the same from the beginning of time. God hasn't changed. He's always been love. He's been goodness. He's been wisdom. And he's always provided a way of grace. His heart has always been for the oppressed and the struggling. But I believe at different times and in different places, he finds ways to reveal deeper, new understandings of himself and the kingdom of what is needed by a people that is ready, that are ready at that juncture, looking always to further manifest the varied and amazing flavors of his heart so that his love and grace can shine all the more, reaching all the more who are open to receive. First Peter says, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its varied forms. My hope is that we will be like Levi and say yes to sip new wine that he has for us. And I wonder what that new wine will be. Are we going to be willing and available to see value in people that others miss? Are we going to be willing to try new methods of reaching out, of loving, serving, and building bridges? Are we going to find more ways to celebrate life with God rather than bemoan it, knowing he is here, he is in us, he is for us, and we have nothing to fear but missing out on the life that he has waiting for us to experience with him right here, right now. What I would like to do in the last few minutes that we have, we have remaining cake we have offering that's going to be brought up here, offering plates that are going to be brought up here. And I thought as a token of our commitment to being disciples like Levi, who's willing to try new wine, we're going to do a little wine tasting today. Not down before you go out of here and say, oh my gosh, we tasted, we did a wine tasting at Inspire. I have other things that we're going to taste as well. The whole idea is if you are brave enough to try new flavors that you haven't previously tried in your life, then maybe your spirit could be open to trying new ways and being open to new people as God brings them into your life. So what I did is I had a great time and I went shopping. Now, some of you may not have ever deigned to try red sparkling grape juice, so that's here. And there's white sparkling grape juice as well. But if you would like to be a little bit braver, there is a German I can't even pronounce it, sweet red wine. You can take a taste of. There's also, has any of you guys, have you ever tried, I can't even pronounce it, guayaba? Guayaba, guayaba. guayaba juice? Guayaba. guayaba, what is that? Guava. Guava. Ah, guayaba. Okay. 
and mango, pure mango juice. You might want to try that. And then I also found beet juice. Some of you guys might want to get a little tipsy on that. It's non-alcoholic. And then there's, you know, from our own backyard, Southern Red. And there's blueberry blackberry juice. You guys ever tried that? All right, so you can try some of that. And then I have two more. You might want to try lavender love, kombucha. It is lavender and whatever kombucha is, okay? And then aloe, pure aloe. That sounds disgusting. It's good? All right. So here we go. The idea is you are going to do not come up here and drink of these new wines if you're not committing to be disciples who are willing to drink new wine of God. When he gives you an idea, when he shows you somebody that you're thinking, that person can't possibly be used by God, think new thoughts. Think with a new spirit and a new heart like God. Jesus wants us to do, to see with new eyes and hear with new ears and love with new spirits. So let's have the music that we had on before. We're going to bring the offering plates up. There's lots of cups. And I want you guys to, we're going to end out the service with a little new wine tasting. All right, none of you are brave. I feel like a bartender here. <laughs> what do you have? <laughs> They're all open. They're all open. Beat right there. This is German. No, this is Florida. Florida. There's a German one right there. That's German. Tips right here. No, tips right in the baskets. <laughs> There's a non-alcoholic stuff. There's blueberry, blackberry, <laughs> lavender. Anyone want to try lavender? <laughs> lavender. Anyone's going to try? Ooh. Wow. All right. You're going to try some lavender. It really does smell like a lavender plant. All right. That's right. Lavender. Anyone? All right. Lavender. <laughs> oh, she's mixing her drinks now. Okay. All right, try something you've never tried. Aloe. I don't see any brave souls trying the aloe. This is delicious. The guababa. Wow. Okay. Lavender. <laughs> this is strong stuff. What do you think about the lavender? Strong. You want to try this? Okay. Anyone tried aloe yet? Someone brave. You drink it every day? All right, I gotta try something. I'm doing it. Okay. <laughs> Be brave. Yes. And me just a little bit. All right. We're actually going to close in prayer once you finish drinking. All right. Where you are, where you are, just pause for a second. Just pause for a second and have the music down. God, I just want to say, God, silence, Ernie. <laughs> Thank you, God, so much for showing us your heart through these stories, the God of impossibilities, even calling impossible us. May we, as we drink these varied and crazy drinks, these new wines, may we be reminded that you have new wine for us in our lives and for our community and to keep our ears, our eyes, our hearts open to receive what we can use and be to be closer and show you more to our world. We love you in your name. Amen.